Hi, it's Amy with Microbe Minded. Today, I'm going to talk with George Tetz. George is an MD, PhD researcher who heads the Human Microbiology Institute in New York City. The Human Microbiology Institute researches the human microbiome in both health and disease, with a particular focus on bacteriophages. Bacteriophages are viruses that infect bacteria, and by doing so, modulate their activity and behavior. Bacteriophages are also the most numerous organisms in the human body. But Tetz and team look beyond just these functions of bacteriophages and are also studying the ability of bacteriophages to interact with human cells, mammalian cells, and also with the human immune system. And they are also studying bacteriophages as novel mammalian pathogens in conditions like Parkinson's disease and type one diabetes. So join me now as I talk about these topics more with George. George, hey, how are you? Oh, good, thank you very much. Thank you for reaching me out. So we're working in the microbiome area for the last definite, I think, 15 years. And uh, we have set up the Human Microbiology Institute uh, several years ago to combine all our scientific uh, efforts from our scientific team. Mm -hmm. And uh, currently we're pioneers in the so-called phagobiome research. We're the first to show that bacterial viruses that are named bacteriophages are mm -hmm. actually previously overlooked human pathogens. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is something that uh, people should be concerned about. And mm -hmm. definitely it needs a lot of additional scientific research. I agree. Yes, I was really excited when I read your paper, um, Bacteriophages as Novel Mammalian Pathogens. It's something that I've, I've read a lot of research um, over the past century that would indicate that, but I don't see, as you say, many teams studying that. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? So um, just to give people context, um, we've been studying the human microbiome and we've mostly been looking at bacteria. And how do you add the bacteriophages into that picture? I will tell you. So, well, uh, indeed, the predominant part of the human microbiome right now is dedicated solely for the bacteria. And actually, mm -hmm. that was indeed due to the lack of effective methods to study the whole microbial population. Right. Whereas the originally used methods, such as uh, whole genome, se uh, as a genome sequencing using 16S RNA, that is right now the most cheap and the most mm -hmm. broadly spread across different scientific groups. It allow only the identification of uh, the variety of bacterial species, mm -hmm. but it, it does not allow to go into more details in, in studying the other components of micro of human microbiome. Mm -hmm. And actually analyzing the variety of data uh, of that state that uh, human microbiome is implicated in the development of different pathologies, I noticed that all these analysis, they actually, they lack one very important component. They mm -hmm. lack bacteriophages. So right now there are a lot of debates about the role of antibiotics treatment on the, for example, or in the early childhood for the mod modulation of microbiota and the development of different diseases. And definitely it is an important. However, the most influential and the most important regulators of microbiota stability are not antibiotics. They are bacterial viruses, named bacteriophages. And all these studies, they were lacking the deep analysis of what happened with their bacteriophages communities at the time. So just a very, very brief background. So bacterial yeah. viruses, right, they are regular viruses, but their hosts are not human cells or not eukaryotic cells, but only bacterial cells. Right. And actually, that was one of the reasons why they were previously overlooked, because no one had paid attention for it, because, well, bacterial viruses that infect bacteria, that's it. However, as I mentioned, the, once the concept, uh, the emerging concept of the role of alterations of microbiome appeared, mm -hmm. so it is definitely, from my perspective, the study of these regulators of microbiota, it is something that uh, scientific community should uh, take care of. It is very complicated because there is a lot of, it is like, like dark matter of the bacteriophages mm -hmm. because first of all, they outnumber the total number of bacterial cells over tenfold. There are a lot of 
previously unknown and not, not yet known bacteriophages at the moment. Right. However, if we're talking about the phages that are currently well known and currently can be studied, of course, it is something that, it, although it is not well studied yet, but um, right. we have tried to manage it and try to evaluate their role and implication in different diseases. So that is what we do currently here at the Human Microbiology Institute. That's great. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's obviously it, bacteriophages must be playing a role, a, a prominent role in regulating the microbiome, it seems, by definition. Um, can you explain how, what bact how, more specifically, how bacteriophages modulate bacterial behavior? Sure. So there is um, not only, let me go maybe a little bit uh, broader, how do mm -hmm. bacteriophages can affect human health? Because that I think it also, is a little sure. bit more, right, because mm -hmm. the way of their interplay with bacteria is just only one sort of, right. uh, of, their, of their, how do they, can they, they can affect humans. So yeah. actually we have, uh, in our research, we have, this, um, have separated the bacteriophages ways of how bacteriophages can affect human health on two main pathways. Mm -hmm. One, a direct interplay with host micro, microorganism, and right. another one is the indirect when mm -hmm. phages affect microorganism by modulating microbiota. So mm -hmm. if we'll start talking about the first one, the direct way of bacteriophages mm -hmm. implication in human diseases, uh, there we see two main, actually two main components. First of all is uh, that bacteriophages can interplay with human cells. And mm -hmm. although before 2016 or 2017, you know, this work was done in, filed in 2017, it was un uh, unclear. However, the latest research uh, from our colleagues, it shows that actually bacteriophages can affect and can directly interplay with human cells penetrating within human bodies. And of course, it is obvious that the different ways of how bacteriophages can interact with human cells still to be known. Uh, mm -hmm. There are a lot of research right now from their Pollard Institutes that uh, mm -hmm currently showing how bacteriophages can directly interact and interplay with the leukocytes and mm -hmm. lead to the alterations of their cytokine production and uh, yes. uh, modulator-like receptor and immune response. And definitely it is also a direct way of how bacteriophages can affect human health. Mm -hmm. uh, finally, we, in our recent work, we have identified the number of prion-like domains on the mm -hmm. surface of bacteriophages. And uh, the prion concept, prion proteins, they are proteins uh, they are, that are misfolded. Mm -hmm. And uh, once the, these proteins are misfolded in human organism, they lead to the consequent appearance of other misfolded mm -hmm. proteins. And in turn, it lead, uh, if this misfolding happens in such an emerging human proteins like uh, a beta or um, tau protein for Alzheimer's mm -hmm. disease or uh, alpha synuclein for Parkinson's disease, the protein misfolding lead to the deposition of highly neurotoxic mm -hmm. um, protein components and uh, composites within human brain leading to the development of these neurodegenerative diseases that are currently emerging and unfortunately kill a lot of people. Right. So we have identified the number of prion-like domains on the surface of these Mm -hmm. mm, bacteriophages and uh, it is an important because definitely they can lead to the they can act as their seeding components meaning that the as, as an initial trigger for the protein misfolding and mm -hmm. it is also a very important and very interesting part of the research that we currently do uh, in collaboration in uh, collaboration and uh, we will be happy we have some very interesting data and we'll be happy to share with early nine, 2019. So with respect to the interact uh, pathway of how do bacteriophages affect human health is of course, first of all, it is the decrease or increase in the number of um, certain bacterial population within human gut. For right. example, in our study that uh, was published with respect to the Parkinson's disease, mm -hmm. uh, we have identified that the bacteria, lactococcus bacteriophages Right. led to the decrease in the number of lactococcus bacteria right. that in turn led uh, to the disappearance of these populations prior to the uh, appearance, to the onset of uh, first symptoms of these patients.
Got it. And, uh, and that changed not up. to go maybe into too yeah. much into more details with these diseases. Uh, the same concept it was also noticed by other scientists for the uh, Crohn's disease, yeah. uh, for the obesity, where the implementation of microbiota is well known as um, to be associated with the triggering of these diseases. So right. right now we expand this research to other neurodegenerative diseases and uh, to certain autoimmune pathologies, including mm -hmm. our latest research in Taiwan diabetes. Yeah. So and okay. the final pathway, it is the fourth uh, indirect mm -hmm. pathway, is that bacteriophages, once they kill bacteria or lead to the disruption of microbial biofilms, it leads right. to the release of pathogen associated molecular patterns mm -hmm. such as LPS or cell free DNA that are bacterial cell free DNA or bacterial LPS that in turn are pretty well known triggers of a cascades of uh, immunological reactions that can affect and uh, can be suggested as a triggering factors of different uh, multi faceted human diseases. Got it. Well, that was a really good summary of you. You're looking at a lot of topics, but all really, really relevant. Um, yeah, in the case of the lactococcus phages, it modulated the activity of bacteria that produce dopamine, right? So that was, that was part of what your study found, correct? So like the uh, yes, actual right. So we have a, in Parkinson's study, uh, we have identified that patients are, who developed, um, actually it was a uh, we compared in this study the two patient popular uh, two populations. One of them were uh, with very early Parkinson's disease, meaning mm -hmm. they were even treatment naive, and the yeah. second one was age matched control group. Yeah, and we have identified that patients with Parkinson's disease they had a decreased number of Lactococcus bacteria, and we identified that the decrease of Lactococcus bacteria was mm -hmm. due to the uh, highly elitic infection of these microorganisms um, due to lactococcus bacteriophages. Right, right. And uh, the role, uh, lactococcus bacteria, they play a very particular role right. in the human gut, particularly mm -hmm. in uh, Parkinson's disease. So right. first of all, they're an important regulators of, micro of um, intestinal permeability. Okay. And their increased intestinal permeability is known as a, as a, um, a one of the well-known, uh, mm -hmm. maybe not key mechanism, but an important mechanism that is implicated in the disease pathogenesis and leading to the chronic inflammation that can in turn affect those people. And mm -hmm. on the other hand, the electrococcus bacteria within human gut, they're an important producers of uh, different um, neuro neurochemicals and they're an important component of the entire nervous system. So right. one of the components that are produced by these microorganisms is our intestinal dopamine. Exactly. And th it is a pretty well known uh, that there, according to there's a so-called gut-oriented Parkinson's disease mm -hmm. that states that the initial step of Parkinson's disease uh, at, uh, starts not in the brain, but in the enteric nervous system. Right. And then retrogradly, uh, through the uh, nervous vagus goes up to the brain and lead uh, to these alterations that are pretty well known as uh, Parkinson's disease. Yeah. So yeah. We, we would like to highlight. So in these patients, we identified that bacteriophages killed microorganisms that are an important regulators for the enteric nervous system and mm -hmm. that are known um, to be associated with the uh, uh, with their decree, with their, with the maintenance of normal balance mm -hmm. of uh, intestinal dopamine. Right. That's what interests me most about the finding is it's such a clear mechanism. It's not just that the phages, you know, deplete it is, random um, microbe. There's, you know, an actual connection between the dysbiosis, if you want to call it that, and, you know, the, the neurotransmitter production and other aspects of the, you know, that could directly contribute to the condition. We're very happy because here at the HMI, we have um, not only bioinformatics stuff, but also people with their MD degree, and they pretty much know about their implication of certain microorganisms in their, in their interplay and in right. their, in how do they are involved 
in normal work of human of human microorganism and what happens yeah. when something goes wrong with that. Yeah, that's great because you can get the bioinformatics data, but then you have the biological knowledge to also better interpret the data, which is, sounds like a really right. cool thing for your group. Cool. Um, in the type 1 diabetes study, what did you find with phages there that you've done so far? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so we have received, uh, so the data is not published yet. We have submitted the paper, so waiting for the approval. Okay. Uh, but what we have received, it, wa um, it was a longitudinal hum human microbiome study from mm -hmm. ch of children from uh, their birth until three year of until three years of their world of their age. Uh, all children were had a certain HLA mutations. Okay. Uh, there, therefore, meaning that all these children they were highly susceptible to type one diabetes. Okay. However, in poor three years of age, only the number of patients so were converted to islet autoimmunity and to type 1 diabetes. However, some other patients, uh, although they had uh, these altered genes, they have never developed signs of autoimmunity. So okay. we have identified that children who further develop uh, type 1 diabetes or so converted, they mm -hmm. had an initially very high levels of E. coli in their gut. And then we have identified, as far as it was a longitudinal microbiome analysis, so we could follow up uh, what happened with this E. coli population during a certain time periods. We identified that all children before the appearance of autoantibodies, they mm -hmm. had a complete disappearance of E. coli in their gut. And the reason why that happened was due to the fact that... Um, these patients had an elevated levels. Um, they had, sorry, they had an active prophages infection, okay. meaning that bacteriophages were responsible for the elimination of these E. coli population in their gut. And uh, E. coli, they are a member of Enterobacteria family, and they're mm -hmm. pretty well known that one of the pathogenic associated molecular patterns, so so called PAMs, mm -hmm. that can be released from the biofilms of these microorganisms, it is known to be highly immunogenic and can trigger other, um, other pathologies and other um, diseases, including, for example, systemic lupus erythematosus. Mm -hmm. So here we state that actually bacteriophages through this indirect mechanism led to the um, appearance of highly immunogenic bacterial proteins that mm -hmm. in turn could trigger the autoimmunity uh, and turn uh, to type right. 1 diabetes. And so in a way, it doesn't seem like autoimmunity is really what's going on in the, in the classical sense in terms of the immune system only reacting to self in those conditions. It would seem now that we need to better study how the immune system for, reacts to um, pathogen peptides. Or right. in, the question right. is about, well, actually a lot of research is dedicated particularly to, uh, to these things. However, mm -hmm. or the question is the most important question, what happens and why do even people with altered genetics, why do some people develop this disease and uh, why some not? So what happens in the patients who do develop it? And uh, the, sometimes the simple microbiome analysis cannot completely address it. So it's necessary to go into more details and to uh, your human and additional animal studies that is currently right now we're doing. It. For sure. Um, Right. So, you know, we treat now autoimmune conditions with um, immunosuppressive drugs, strong doses of that. How do you think that affects the phages that might be actually driving a large part of the dysbiosis? It is a dark matter. It is what? a really dark matter uh, because mm -hmm. on the one hand, definitely the, uh, the current research, there is, there is not so much data about how to uh, different types of therapies affect bacteriophages. Uh, right. Neither neither chemotherapy and nor antibiotic right. therapy, right? And meaning that certain alterations that uh, that can be following these uh, therapies in terms for the effect, um, effect on bacteriophages, it is something that is completely unknown. 
Right. There's not even a lot of studies yet that look at the bacterial microbiome um, in patients with immunosuppressant drugs for long periods of time, which I find frustrating because I actually um, find it to be a difficult paradigm now that we shut down the immune system uh, solely in most of these patients with these conditions when the microbiome and virome seem to be playing a large role in them. Well, on the other hand, these patients, as for now, they no, for didn't, now, have, uh, didn't have much options. Exactly. I'm talking about future, though, in terms of you know future development of treatments um, that we I think might. The most important thing in their future development, and that is actually what we do here at the Human Microbiology Institute, mm -hmm. is because when you can figure out the real cause of the disease, exactly, it is possible for uh, the develop programs for the primary prevention to completely mm -hmm. eradicate it. But for that, you need to know what is the truth causal ca uh, mechanism of um, what actually yeah. leads uh, for the development of these pathology. Right. So if we can better understand the root cause mechanisms, you know, now by better studying bacteriophages and all the entire ecosystem of, of microbes, we can probably do some better root cause therapies in the future. That's the goal, right? Yeah. Absolutely. I agree with you. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, when it comes to phages, um, you know, I've read studies on phages going back for 100 years or more. How come um, bacteriophages almost fell out of favor in research? I just, it, we've known about them forever, and it's interesting to me, why did we become so bacteria-centric? Are there any reasons for that historically? Yeah, well, yes. For example, historically, there was a lot of research, and actually it continues to be uh, some research uh, centers in former USSR in Georgia. Mm -hmm. And uh, right now, there, I know there are a lot of um, US and European companies that employ bacteriophages for the treatment of multi-resistant bacteria. Yes. And actually, there is a lot of sense for doing it, because first mm -hmm. of all, the most part of bacteriophages, they're highly selective. Right. meaning that certain bacteriophages will kill uh, only their host, only yeah. uh, their bug. And uh, that is why bacteriophages are used for the therapy of, uh, uh, are trying to be used. Well, yeah, exactly. Right, we're, right. We're, there are we're, a lot of attempts and some of them are very successful right. uh, to, overcome, um, to overcome the antibiotic resistance. Of course, yeah. for example, there's a number of bacteria, for example, like multi-resistant Pseudomonas aeruginosa or multi-resistant uh, Staph aureus, for example, yes. from children with cystic fibrosis, who yes. are completely insensitive to the total panel of antibiotics. Mm -hmm. And actually these, if we're talking about cystic fibrosis, is predominantly children. These children just have no other options. Or for example, if we're talking about the uh, diabetic ulcers that are also caused yeah. by polymicrobial infections with mm -hmm. a lot of um, a lot of multi-resistant bacterial stuff. So their attempts to use bacteriophages surf, um, uh, topically to eradicate infection is great. It is great. Moreover, <laughs> moreover uh, what we our discovery at the Human Microbiology Institute, mm -hmm. we're not going against these mainstream. Oh, yeah. Because we're talking about completely different things. We're right. not talking about that the use of bacteriophages is not safe. No, it's about yeah. a little bit different question. It's about can bacteriophages, and of course, they're not phages that are used for the treatment mm -hmm. of uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa or MRSA. Yeah. Other phages, can they be uh, previously overlooked human pathogens? Right. In simple terms, to me, it's sort of like the way we use certain bacterial species as probiotics, and we're fairly familiar with how like a lactobacillus strain might act, but we don't use pathogens as probiotics. I mean, we use specific bacteria, so we could do the same with phages. We would understand, um, we can work to better understand the specific targets of each phage, and we don't, you know, we can, we can know what we're doing. We have a better idea of what we're selecting for, yeah. Um, when it comes to phage therapy, um, I guess I would say though, I think that your research would add to phage therapy as in if we understand the phage populations that might already be um, in the per patient being treated, we might you know, actually improve the phage therapy outcome. It just seems like the more information we have on how phages are already functioning would, would add to the almost success of the treatment. Uh, first of all, yes. And uh, on the other hand, the extra knowledge for the role of phages in human health 
can right. add extra level of safety for the exactly. usage of phages right. for the therapy. Right, because we might be trying to use a phage and then realize that that phage might be acting in a way we didn't realize, and now we can use a better phage. And, you know, it gives us just more ability to understand how we're using them. I think that's really important. So, okay, cool. Um, I guess, um, would you review one more time the leaky gut issue with phages? I'm going to call it leaky gut. Sure. That's just it was actually, a while, I think it was our first, mm -hmm. uh, first uh, to first publications in this yeah. area. One of them was uh, in, done in collaboration uh, with her also with the New York mm -hmm. University. So we have identified that bacteriophages as uh, regulators of microbiota stability can increase intestinal permeability leading to the uh, chronic inflammation. And in turn, chronic inflammation and increased uh, leaky gut, they're known to be associated with a variety of human diseases uh, including neurodegenerative pathologies and autoimmune diseases because they cause the, uh, uh, they lead to the aberrant way of, high Im of how immune system responds uh, to exactly. the uh, regular stimuli. That's so what we, really have used the uh, we have used the uh, rats and uh, gave mm -hmm. them a cocktail of different bacteriophages Interesting that we have used bacteriophages that are very commonly found in the wastewater or in water plants. So uh, they were phages against Aphorus, Pseudomonas, against mm -hmm. E. coli, and not against, I just want to highlight, not against the Electrococcus species or Physobacterium species. I wanted, that was a question I had for you actually. How did you choose the phages for that study? We used them from the wastewater. Interesting. We isolated it. Okay. And uh, interesting because uh, the results that we have received, mm -hmm. we, uh, we evaluated following the microbiome. So in then uh, the animals were given with these strong bacteriophage you know, cocktail mm -hmm. for, for the number of days, two times daily with water. Uh, they were even not ejected. So, and then these bacteriophages caused a significant alterations of their intestinal microbiota that was revealed with their whole genome sequencing. And moreover, we have measured the signs for increased intestinal permeability in this animal, so-called uh, lactulose mannitol ratio. And we have evaluated that all animals who were exposed to bacteriophages had an increased intestinal permeability and a decrease of lactococcus bacteria and some other bacteria that are known to be an important regulators of um, gut permeability. But we have, notably, we have never gave them phages that That's were dedicated direct, uh, directly, that could directly eliminate these bacteria. Meaning That's that exactly. bacteriophages can lead to the cascade of mm -hmm. microbiota alterations, finally leading to the decrease of the number of bacterial species. Right, and so what you're also showing is that you, we now see such a correlation between environment and these conditions. You're actually showing that phages in whatever it is in the environment, be it in our food, our water, whatever, could affect us. You know, it actually provides a, a almost a, a new mechanism to understand how people will sometimes say that they had a, a, a they drank contaminated water and they got a disease, or they, you know what I mean? It seems like it's. A, I don't want to, to scare anyone, but one yeah, I know. Of water contains ten as their eighth power of bacteriophages. We might as well know that, you know, I don't see how it's going to hurt anyone to look at the reality of what might, you know, where things are, and then we can better sort out how to deal with the problem. A lot of research has to be done in this mm -hmm. area. Exactly. So you could, we can easily pick up phages from our environment, correct? So, right. yeah. And so in fact, wasn't there one study that, that estimated that something like 31 billion bacteriophages will sort of traffic from the gut through the body every day? Uh, yes. So that's a, that's a lot of phages. So that's, I guess, another question. It is notably, I think it is, with this article, it was published in 2017 in right. Empire. And this is an article that highlighted that bacteriophages could interact with their right. human cells, right? Epithelial with, cells, right? Yeah, exactly. So that's huge. I mean, so we're looking at these billions of organisms. And by the way, they're definitely been found outside the gut frequently, correct? Right. So even in the cerebral spinal fluid or even in the placenta phages, right? But the brain, right, right now that right. has good brain phage data. So, okay, so we're basically looking 
at organisms that can persist on most human tissue and blood and contribute to, you know, are probably... And uh, notably, they can uh, persist in two ways. Because mm -hmm. bacteriophages, they uh, can be, they present in two states. One of them are free living, so, sorry, they're not living elements, right? But free yeah. presenting elements mm -hmm. like lytic bacteriophages. Right. And another one, when bacteriophages are integrated in bacterial genomes, so-called prophages, but in this case, they can exit a bacterial mm -hmm. cell at not every time, any time, but they can regulate the time when they can exit from bacterial cell and lead to the productive infection. So definitely a lot of bacteria, even within cerebrospinal fluid, for example, right. uh, they do have bacteriophages, right. maybe not directly, but indirectly within their genome. Got it. Yeah. And you know, I was thinking about this the other day. Um, when we've been doing analysis, let's just say a big data analysis where we collect a lot of um, RNA or something. We're trying to understand what, what microbes might be present in a, in a sample. Um, if there are prophages in the, uh, you know, in, in, the back, in the different bacteria identified, is that going to change the, the sequencing, the, the results from it that? It depends on the method, what was used for the right. sequencing. Because right now, if we are not accounting for phages, you know, in, you know, phages in bacterial, like a lysogenic phage, wouldn't the analysis of that bacterial species turn out a bit differently in certain, you know, different analysis? Well, uh, in the case, if you will be using, not really, but I think yeah. the most important thing, so. Uh, how do you separate them out? To be clear, when you're doing analysis, how do you figure out what's the phage genome and the bacterial genome? To just be more sure. sure. So uh, there are different ways for doing it. Mm -hmm. and it depends on the source and on the final goal. Because for mm -hmm. example, if we are looking, um, we will, let's imagine that we want to figure out that bacteriophage is uh, present in certain, mm -hmm. I don't know, like in certain biological fluid. Right. In this case, we can try to figure out is there a whole genome within mm -hmm. this bacteria. That makes sense. And yeah. then with a special algorithm to evaluate what is the a number of the total copies of this genome. Got Another it. way, for example, uh, it is possible to make a literature search and mm -hmm. to evaluate which bacteriophages are strictly lysogenic and which mm -hmm. are, can, be pro, uh, can, can be both there as a prophages or in a lytic state. And yeah. for example, if we're interesting, re interested in the analysis of lytic bacteriophages, so mm -hmm. we can suggest that if, um, if, there re, if, there is a, if there are genomes of solely leading bacteriophages in the material, that means that there are solely leading bacteriophages right. uh, within this material, just because they have no ability to persist within bacterial right. genomes. That makes sense. Okay, cool. Yeah, I mean, that's, it seems key to me now that we would need to really account for that now, understanding now that a lot of the bacterial species we're studying might have associated phages, even when it comes, you know, it sounds obvious, but <laughs> I guess not. Um, so, okay, um, where your background is from the USSR? Uh, well, I'm originally right uh, from St. Petersburg, from Russia, okay. and Russia. then my sisters are from Estonia. So long story. So did you, how did you get into bacteriophage research? Um, is it because there's more going on um, over there? It was or? about the, uh, uh, I started dealing with the microbiome researchers, as mm -hmm. I mentioned. So I have just noticed that there is a very big discrepancy between mm -hmm. the data analysis of the number of certain, the number of articles and uh, the results that, uh, that were received. Because no yeah. one had paid an attention of why there were alterations of the microbiome. What happened with right. these bacterial communities? Because just right. the analysis that, well, these bacteria, uh, the number of these bacteria was decreased, yeah, exactly. and because of that, the number of these bacteria was increased, and then certain factors were released. It's interesting, but why? Yeah. What was an initial yeah. trigger? Mm -hmm. Got it. And so to you, um, I don't know, it's, you have a fairly phage-centric view of that as opposed to the bacteria sort of oh, sorry, modulated. I didn't catch. Can you repeat once again, please? I guess like you have a fairly um, phage-like centered view, I think. So do bacteria, can bacterial activity modulate phage activity, obviously, and back and forth? I mean, it's, 
or it's mostly obviously yeah of course uh, particularly when bacteria when bacteria when bacteriophage is within bacterial genome there exactly. are a number of ways of how bacteria exactly. can interplay with uh, bacteriophages moreover for example if we're talking about the initial steps of bacteriophages infection of bacteria right. there is a pretty big number of ways how bacteria can manage and can not affect uh, bacteriophages DNA to penetrate within right. the bacterial cell. So yeah, depending on the CRISPR-Cas system or whatever of the bacterial species a person has, you're gonna actually see, I guess then that different phages will be able to persist in an individual's microbiome based on that factor. What about inherited phages? I mean, obviously, the, do you, how do you see that as, a, as something that may be contributing to you know, diseases past? In we are working on that, right. Uh, particularly taking into consideration that the very important part of human genome, it is translated vertically from the mothers. That means that the number of bacteriophages, both lytic and their uh, prophages, are inherited from our parents as well. Exactly. Because I'm, uh, I'm another really, question. Yeah. Sorry, go on. I apologize. Oh, no, it's fine. I'm particularly interested in the breast milk microbiome, which to me has a pretty big impact on. Um, you know, infant health. Are, have you looked at that? I mean, no, um, no, no that not yet. Analysis. Not yet because of the lack of uh, well sequenced and uh, mm -hmm. highly, mm -hmm. highly purified metagenomic data. So right. we have not used it yet. We haven't studied it yet. Um, but it is something that we keep eye, uh, um, that we keep keep an eye on. That another important question is about the safety of mm -hmm. uh, fecal microbiome transplantation. Uh, Agreed with that. Because right. it is something that, on the one hand, it's a question about not being real about safety. It's a question about how it is necessary uh, to pick up the donor. Yeah, uh, exactly. For and these probably the efficacy, how it ends up, it, some people seem to benefit more than others. Well, about the right. uh, efficacy, yes. But uh, for example, if patient with their Crohn's disease or some IBD, uh, need the fecal microbiome transplant and it doesn't work once or twice, right. this patient just get it for the third or for the fourth time. Yeah, exactly. And more often it works out, but the question is about the safety. And yeah, what happens right. with their persons, and with the recipient's microbiome, particularly taking into consideration that the very big number of prophages, both lytic and lysogenic, yeah. they enter gut of these patients right. and actually colonize them. And it's a question about the long-term safety. Yeah, I, I agree with you, exactly. In that and I have no answer on that. Introduced a whole Just a lot of phase. research has to be done in order There's so to many, out, exactly. find out algorithms that should be more better fit for such an individual medicine. Exactly, because you're introducing a whole new phage population into a person and we don't know the implications of that. I agree with you. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, I'm, as on one of your papers, obviously this is, just something too, we pass phages from person to person. So, you know, that's a thing. It is. We um, do it like viruses uh, transmitted from person to people, from people to people. The same stuff happens right. with bacteriophages. And uh, the main difference is that phages can be passed as a little phages or uh, together with bacterial stuff. Got it, right. Because there are case clusters of certain conditions, sarcoidosis, this, you know, and it's, it's a mystery. And uh, honestly, it does seem possible that there's some sharing of organisms. That's something I've always thought of. So in it, this case, it raises another question that is uh, an important, although it is speculative, is that mm -hmm. if there are so-called bacteriophages diseases, right. can they be transmitted mm -hmm. and can they be contagious or not? Exactly. Which is, I think, just yet another... From my perspective, from my perspective, it can. But uh, the question is about that not only uh, the right recipient for the development of this disease, it is not only a person with a certain genetical susceptibility, but also right. with a certain microbiome. So yes. it just adds some extra numbers of complexity that right. are according to the existing bioinformatics methods there very difficult uh, to be computed and to be analyzed. But it is something that we also work on and we keep eye on that. It's really interesting. Yeah, that's another reason why I worry about patients being put on a lot of immunosuppressive drugs is because it seems to me that that would 
change the dynamics of microbial transfer. I mean, also in some of the phage therapy cases, you know, when you're doing the phage therapy on a, you know, a very immunocompromised patient because they're, you know, a transplant donor or something, I don't know, it seems to me that that would probably, you know, affect the efficacy of how things turn out, correct? Because then we do know that it the- can be. It is something that has to be studied down the road. Yeah, exactly. I agree with you. It would be really cool to me for someone to study, you know, the differences in patients on, um, you know, immunocompromising drugs versus uh, with phage therapy versus those that are, you know, are not on those medications because the phages, I suppose, since phages are interacting with the human immune response, there would be possibly some differences. I think that's key. So when just go ahead, so that's the last question. Remind me, um, just tell me one more time about how phages, so I think they can actually, um, you know, active, you know, TLR2 activation, you know, stuff like that, where you go through that, you found that they actually really do. Did you mention the TLRs or am I crazy? Uh, sorry, can you repeat once again? I just, oh, sorry, okay. you know, how phages, how you found that phages can actually, um, the immune response will actually activate in response to phage. They- so as I mentioned, yeah. right, so there is a lot of study, not a lot, not a lot, mm-hmm. but uh, there is a, a lot of research, particularly from Poland. Yeah, that's uh, interesting. Dedicated uh, to this area. Okay. And actually they study how do, how do bacteria phages can affect the interleukins level, how do that's they, whether or not they can, uh, alter the um, expression of toll-like receptors, yeah. and uh, yeah. actually it is also very important, uh, but it's sometimes not directly dedicated to the direct way of how phages interact mm-hmm. with leukocytes, but sometimes it's also dedicated to the indirect way of how mm-hmm. phages can affect uh, the host immune response. Really interesting. Well, okay. <laughs> I could probably, you could probably talk forever because what, just I guess one more thing, what uh, conditions are you going to look at? Are you going to stick to what you're doing? Are you going to expand some more conditions that you're going to look at phages in or what's next for you? Um, well, it will be, first of all, it will be a surprise to everyone, <laughs> but I will tell you it is something from uh, neurodegenerative diseases and from their immune, uh, from their autoimmune pathologies. Great. All right. I, we couldn't get enough research on that, in my opinion. That's uh, awesome. All right. Well, it's been great to speak with you. Um, thanks for your time. Thank you very much. I appreciate your interest uh, for our work and uh, would be happy to share with uh, more good news, more good scientific news with our scientific community. Perfect. All right. Well, we'll be in touch then.